Hey, call me Louis. This is my spot. Louis spot. Now, Egyptians made a journey across the Atlantic. How did they do that? Why did they do that? How do we know that they do it? They did it. Listen carefully. Do not confuse modern Egypt with ancient Egypt. These are two totally different worlds. Here we are in America, and it would be very difficult to find an American in this room. We call ourselves Americans because we are in America. We are American citizens. But there are African people here, European people perhaps, Asian people, but no Americans. I am part American, I am part Makusi Indian and part African, but it would be difficult to find an American audience that is pure American. That's why Egypt, do you go to Egypt and you said the Arab is not an Egyptian? The people who built the pyramids were not Arabs. I know, man, because I am responsible for returning to the bloody Arabs, the splinters of the Sphinx's nose and chin, and the Arabs do not want to remake it because it looks Negro. But we can go into the graves. We can go into the graves and we find the hard, hard evidence, the skeletal evidence is overwhelming. But you see, Egypt was so rich. The Africans were so extraordinary. And they were not superior people. You don't have inferior and superior people. This is what makes you superior and inferior. A certain vision of the world. A certain vision of yourself. Many of us have been destroyed. Reduced. Because we've been made to accept other people's vision of us. You look at Hitler. Hitler was a bloody lunatic. He threw, threw him in prison in his early 20s. Hitler was walking about the prison like this. Guards bowed to him. That was an awesome person, boy. I mean, he was evil, but he was awesome. Napoleon, too. Napoleon wasn't even a Frenchman. Most people don't know that. I am destined to glorify a people I hate. Could you imagine that? That's Napoleon. I read his diaries, I am destined to glorify a people I hate. And then the one thing I regret most in my life, this is Napoleon. The one thing I regret most in my life is that I did not make Toussaint. I did not make the black Toussaint governor of Haiti. I blame it on my black wife. Do you know Napoleon was married to Malata from the West Indies? Which we would call black hair. But do you know, she was the prejudiced one, not Napoleon. Napoleon wanted to make Toussaint governor of Haiti. His wife said, no, why would you give up territory to It's as crude as that. So bear in mind, here I am responsible. I financed a telephone link up between Gamal Abdul Mokhtar, the Arab delegate to UNESCO. Sheikh Antony up the African delegate to UNESCO, myself, the representative of the British Museum, Garland Roberts who found the pieces, and another gentleman who did translations from the French. And the British began, no, no, Van Sertima, we can't do that. <laughs> because if we start returning this item and that item to this and that museum, we'll have no museum. I said, sir, we're not asking you to return everything from your museums. You're well aware of the things that have been taken from other museums and other places. This is a very specific thing. It is of no value to you. You can't show it. What is the point? You can't show the splinters of the nose. Nobody's interested in splinters. Put the nose back on. <laughs> but the Arabs do the Mokhtar, the Arab delegate, never said a bloody word. Boy, he don't want no nose interfering with the tourist trade in Egypt. It's as crude as that. Look why Egypt is no longer Egyptian. 
Those are not the people who built the pyramids. The Syrians attacked in 654 BC. The Persians attacked in 550 BC. The Greeks attacked in 320 BC. The Romans attacked just before and after Christ. The Arabs attacked 638 to 640 AD. That is why Egypt is no longer Egyptian. They have nothing to do with the building of the pyramids. If you go back in the graves, we have found hard evidence in the graves that the Egyptians were African. Let me listen to the anthropologists, all the great anthropologists. They, because this is hidden, this doesn't come out in history books. The earliest human fossil found in Egypt was a skeleton of the Nazlet Kataman found near Tata, Egypt, which was dated 35,000 to 30,000 years before Christ. Regarding the racial affinity of this skeleton, Toma concludes strong alveolar prognathism combined with fossil prinacillus and an African skull is suggested with negroid morphology. He proves it's a Negro. Then comes Wendorf, 1982. Wendorf the skeleton, discovered the skeleton at Wadi Kubania, located 10 to 15 kilometers north of Aswan in Egypt. This skeleton dated approximately 20,000 years before Christ. The wide nasal aperture, lower nasal margin morphology, presence of the sulcus prinacillus, wide interorbital distance and alveolar prognathism demonstrate affinities with broad African variants. All of the great anthropologists, archaeologists, Thoma, Ferenbach, Wendorf, Stuart, Green, Armilagos, Wrightmore, Crawford, all of them prove that those early Egyptians in the Pyramid Age were African. That's the reason why Mokhtar, the Arab delegate, doesn't want a Negro nose on the Sphinx because they don't want to relate back. But the Germans sent me, I have it in my new book, you see a beautiful color photograph showing you what the world was 1,200 years before Christ. The black is on top of the world. He is in charge of Egypt. There's no question about it. And they built the pyramids. The Japanese came to my friend Sheikh Antony up asked seeking advice and building a pyramid and Sheikh Antony Op said do not use bronze tools and the Japanese said how could you say that the last stage of the Egyptian was the bronze age and he says the last age is not the best age they, you cannot the Japanese would not listen they went there they made such a mess they had to throw them out bronze tools the tools broke they had to use air jack hammers in order to cut the stone, and they could not cut it, the stone, the ancient blacks in Egypt did. Let me tell you, this is scientists reporting with amazement at how these Africans cut stone. The mean variation of the cutting of the stone from a straight line and from a true square is but 0.01 inch in a length of center, 5 inches up the face, an amount of accuracy equal to most modern optician straight edges of such a length. In other words, we only cut eyeglasses like that. These joints with an area of some 35 square feet each were not only worked as finely as this but were cemented throughout. Though the stones were brought as close as one five hundredth of an inch or in fact into contact and the mean opening of the joint was one fiftieth of an inch, yet the builders managed to fill the joint with cement despite the great area of it and the weight of the stone to be moved some sixteen tons. To merely place such stones in exact contact at the sides would be careful work but to do so with cement in the joints is almost impossible. This is Flinders Petrie, our inheritance of the Great Pyramid, London, 1874. Thus the builders of these great monoliths quarried and cut stone within one one thousandth of an inch of mat mathematical perfection and raised the man-made mounting as meticulously as we cut gems. There are approximately two million three hundred thousand blocks of stone which comprise the Great Pyramid. These individual blocks weigh from 2.5 tons to 70 tons, as much as a railroad locomotive. Originally covered an area of 13.1 acres. The Great Pyramid, listen to this as I close on this part. The Great Pyramid contains more stone than all the churches, chapels, and cathedrals built in England since the time of Christ. If all the stone in this pyramid were sawed into blocks one foot in an edge and these were laid end to end, they would stretch two thirds of the way around the globe at the equator. The Great Pyramid contains enough stone to construct 30 Empire State buildings.
Now, if you really knew what the African was doing, most of us would not be behaving like inferiors. We'd have challenged the system a long time ago. <clears throat> the Africans had a fixation about seven. They had a fixation about seven. They created the seven-day week. There's no such thing, you know. The Africans noticed in Egypt that there are seven orifices in the human body. I can't mention all of them. There's seven primary colors in the rainbow. Violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, red. There's seven notes in the musical scale. There's seven layers of skin. There's seven parts of the human brain. There's seven parts of the human eye. Seven is critical in the ages of man. Seven is the age of reason. Fourteen, seven years later, puberty. Twenty-one, seven years later, maturation. Seven, 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 seven. That is why they created the seven deadly sins. Christ is in Egypt. He's not an Egyptian. He's a Jew. He was born in Jerusalem, but he went to Egypt. Read Hosea, out of Egypt shall I call my son. He was brought back to Jerusalem where he was crucified. Seven deadly sins, seven cardinal virtues, seven days of the week. That's the Africans created the seven day week. There's no such thing. Seven, 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 seven. And then they sent out seven ships across the water. Now they had intimate interconnections with the rest of Africa. We have found evidence of that. Lady Lugard reports a visit of Egyptian pharaohs to Hauseland. We have found, and here is where Diop was very helpful to me. Diop and Obenga, Obenga two weeks ago introduced me to an audience in California. Obenga is the most remarkable African scholar in the world at the moment. Sheikh Anta Diop was before, but he died. And I managed to make contact with these gentlemen. Sheikh Anta and I had a, a, a nice quarrel about tobacco because Sheikh Anta was the only African who was allowed to examine mummies in a certain part of Egypt. And he found tobacco in this, mu this mummy, and I was explaining to him that the Africans have their tobacco, the Americans have their tobacco, and I was pointing out that certain distinctions could be made between the two tobaccos and that. In my book, they're using the same term, and I explained why they're using the same term because of a certain kind of pre-Columbian contact, but that it's not the same tobacco. Well, um, the up surrendered and that he was a most remarkable man. I want to dedicate this lecture to him because he had the most profound impact on so many of us. We invited him, we invited him to the Nile Valley Conference and his plane crashed. He didn't die and um, he had to be run, moved from rush from the burning plane and I told him do not come by plane the next time. You are to go and visit your wife in France and then you are to do overland and then you are to take another kind of ship but do not let it be known where you are moving. Okay we are not to talk on the telephone. You have to be very careful about that. The up came to Atlanta. That was a marvelous occasion. He was the most remarkable man I have ever met. And we had these marvelous conversations, etc. But I knew he would die soon, because like John Clark, I noticed it with him too. They do not pay attention to what they're eating. After you get 60, you have to pay close attention to what you're eating. You can't just eat any old thing because it, it dies there and it's not buried easily. So be very careful. I'm 65 and I know. I exercise every day. And that's what saved my life last year. I was, I was rushed to hospital last year. And these crooks in the hospital, they want to make money because they know Rutgers pays most of the bill. So they want to make money. Not telling they have all sorts of things on my heart. I said there's nothing wrong with my heart. Yes. I mean, they have all these sorts of things in my heart. Three days in the hospital and... I don't know what's happening. So I got really, really mad. And when I get mad, I get real mad. <laughs> I grew up in the bush. 
And when I get mad, I behave like a bushman. <laughs> and all the, all the civilized cover, that disappears completely. I just curse, smash up things, etc. And so they came, they held me down. I said, I want to leave right now. They said, well, you can't leave, you know, you're very ill. Something wrong with your heart. I said, there's nothing wrong with my heart. He said, well, if you leave now, you have to pay the bill. I said, well, I've only been here three days. Yes, but your bill is $5,500. <laughs> I say, well, I'll stay. <laughs> um, so, they said, I said, but okay, I make a deal with you. Put me on a treadmill if you think there's something wrong with my heart. And I ran a mile at full speed. And then they shook their head. Well, you're on a bit of stress. But if you had run that mile the way you ran it, and there was something wrong with your heart, you would have died. I said, thank you very much for being so truthful at last. But to come back. The incredible things that we're finding now, we found in America not oh, that the Egyptians made a trip to America. They sent out seven ships. He found it in a tomb in Egypt where the, these ships, seven ships are heading towards the west. Seven was everything to them. So they sent out seven ships. And we, ha we have it in this um, painting among the Ramesses around 1200 BC, these seven ships heading towards the west. And we find intimate interconnections between the Egyptians and the rest of the Africans. Because people could say, okay, Egypt is separate. Today it is, because the Egyptians are no longer Egyptians, just like the Americans are no longer Americans. You come into this room, it would be hard to find a Native American. You go to Egypt, and it's hard to find an Egyptian. So be very careful about the past and the present. These worlds have changed dramatically. And so, we have lots of evidence of their links with the rest of Africa. Shake Antony up and Theophilo Benga presented, and it's in my new book, more than 100 words in Wolof, a West African language, the language of Sheikh Antony up, more than 100 words which are identical in all their forms. That is utterly impossible. UNESCO surrendered. All of these big professors with all their big degrees, and so they had to surrender. Because these two super Africans prove beyond them, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that that's all a lot of nonsense. This is clearly what we say it is. And they surrender. It has been established beyond the shadow of a doubt. The connections between Egypt and the rest of Africa were extraordinary. We have Lady Luga reporting on a visit of Egyptian pharaohs to Hauseland. An Egyptian golden breastplate found in an ancient lay in Nigeria. More than 100 Egyptian words in all their forms and variants found in Wolof, the Ops language. The African word for God, what is the word for God? Amen. You use it in your prayers. That's African. Amen. Jesus was in Egypt, you know. Out of Egypt shall I call my son. He wasn't an Egyptian, he was a Jew, but he went to Egypt. He was smuggled out by his uncle because they were killing off the firstborn. That's how Jesus landed up in Egypt. And this seven day week is Egyptian. Egyptian golden press blade found in ancient Nigeria. As I say, nearly a hundred Egyptian words in all their forms presented to UNESCO. UNESCO had to surrender. They couldn't believe it. Obenga and Diop proved it beyond the shadow of a doubt. They even take the word for God. What is the word for God in Egypt? Amen. You saying it in your prayers, that's Africa. Amen. Amon and Amen is Egyptian. And Am is West African, comes from that. And Nyam is East African. So you have Amen and Amon, Egyptian. And Am, West African. And Nyam, East African. Don't think everything is lost. There are all sorts of clues left in the past. And that if you learn certain things, you can pick them up. So they can't fool us anymore. And we find the incredible things that they did, the building of the pyramids and all these things, but they also built remarkable ships. And we have evidence, not only they show their ships moving, 
but they show it is shown among the Americans, the Popol for the Bible of the Kiche Maya. I have the Bible of the Kiche Maya that shows blacks arrived in America in, before Christ. Champollion supports that. Leverbour support, Lever, supports that. Sahagan supports that. Sorensen supports that. South Soderbergh supports that. Rosalie supports that. I've been through all these documents. They're finding these things and people are just pushing them aside, but not anymore. Then came the clincher. I was invited to, before the Columbus celebration, I was invited to the Smithsonian, the leading scientific institution in this country, hoping to wipe me out before, 49, before 1992. And my opponent surrendered. Showed them the seven braid that you can argue with. No sculpture in America has seven braids. Seven is everything to the African Egyptian. He created the seven day week because he find there's seven parts to the human brain, seven parts to the human eye, seven, seven notes in the musical scale, seven primary colors in the rainbow, seven orifices in the human body, seven layers of skin. You can't argue with that. So he, invent, he invented the seven day week. All this thing about God created the world in six days and rested in the seven. That is taken by the Christians from the Egyptians. Jesus was in Egypt. Even the word Christ, he's not Jesus Christ, he's Jesus the Christ. Christ is an Egyptian word, K-R-S-T, Christ. K-R-S-T, the anointed one. That's how he became the Christ. Don't dismiss him, okay? I'm just pointing out the terms, okay? He was in Egypt, out of Egypt, read Hosea, out of Egypt shall I call my son. He wasn't born in Egypt, but he was smuggled out in Egypt because Herod was killing the firstborn. And he appears among the Egyptian doctors. And so you get certain evidences like that. And I've checked out this, I have so many sources. Champollion, reporting the seven ships arriving from across the water. Champollion, Lefebvre, Sahagan, Sorensen, Sav Soderberg, Rossellini. And above all, the Bible of the Kiche Maya. They destroyed so many books in America, but they didn't enjoy, they didn't destroy all the Bibles of the Kiche Maya. So we have that reporting. These dark-skinned people arriving on seven ships, and these, they have the seven ships. And then we have the clincher. We have a map of South America found in ancient Egypt with correct latitudinal and longitudinal coordinates. I showed that to NASA. I was the first person to go to NASA to study blacks in space. You don't even know what, to, it's not only we don't know the history, we don't even know what's happening. Do you know the leading technical astronaut in our space team is a black man, Colonel Gregory. He's restructured the cockpit of our spaceships. Do you know that the leading woman in our space team is a black woman, Dr. Christine Darden? She's reshaping our airplane so that in the next, in the 21st century, we've just entered certain airplanes, not just the, 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 the exotic airplanes would be able to fly faster than some. Do you know that? No, I had to go there. I nearly died at NASA because they invited me along with delegates from all over the world, China, Russia, various, to witness the blast off of the first black American in space. And I did not realize I have different ears. I grew up in a forest. I hear lights. I thought everybody heard lights. You have to hear differently in the forest. Because snakes, you can't see snakes. Snakes take on the color of trees and foliage. Therefore, you have to hear that when he starts. You have to hear that. Are you dead? I didn't know I had different ears. I thought everybody heard lights. I'm standing, these Russian and Chinese delegates, and I'm standing five and a half miles away from the spaceship. This is an awesome thing. It's bigger than a house. And we're going to send, shoot it off into space. And they start to count down, and they stop. Something wrong. And I start looking now, how could something be wrong? You know, a big thing like that with all this incredible thing, if it explodes, what would happen? Then they start to count down again. The third time they start to count down, you had this tremendous noise and I fell over because my ears, blood came out of my ears. 
because I hear differently from urban people. I grew up in the jungle, I hear different. So that, that, that really startled the hell out of me. I never went back to NASA after that. <laughs> but I'd learned enough about it. It's in the book, Blacks and Science, Ancient and Modern. You see me with the leading technical astronaut, etc. And you would be amazed what blacks are doing in this country. Totally unknown. Bell Labs employs more than a thousand black scientists. They created the, the transoceanic cable. They were major in that development. They're reshaping our airplanes. They they remade the cockpit of the space shuttle. You never hear about that. If a black commits a crime, yeah, that's news. But when he does something extraordinary, oh my God, no, there's something mistake here. It's like the New York Times calling the black Val Herbe, so nobody would think it's the black. Now they're saying this Negro they found in Brazil came from. Asia, could you imagine that? She's going to take a ship all the way to the edge of South America and walk all the way up to Brazil because there are no currents of taking off. Walk all the way to Brazil to drop her bloody skull. This is the state of the world we are in. But let me show you the slides now because you have to see some of these things to believe them. So if we could shift to the slides. But the one more thing I must say, just one more thing, very important. They have found the map of South America in ancient Egypt. It was known as the Piri Reis map because of a Turkish admiral who found it there. And it has correct latitude and longitudinal coordinates. No European could have drawn such a map until after 1744 when the chronometer was invented. Yet the Africans had it before Christ. 